you by SFU's. This is brought to you by SFU's Faculty of Science, and this is Nobel Prize Lectures. Thank you for joining us tonight. At this time, we will wait another minute for more attendees to enter the room. All right, we have 502. I guess we can get started. Yes, thank you. Hello, and welcome to the 2023 Nobel Prize Lectures. This event is brought to you by Simon Fraser University's Faculty of Science, and we hold this event every year to celebrate the Nobel Awardees and their impressive research work and allow our community and friends to engage in meaningful conversations with our uh, university faculty members about this amazing research. First of all, let me acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Masquiam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We thank them for having cared for these lands and water since time of mind, and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. Tonight, we recognize the contributions of the 2022 Nobel Prize awardees in chemistry, physics, and medicine or physiology. Experts from SFU will highlight the impact of these prizes and the connections between fundamental and applied research. My name is uh, Corina Anjaoyu from SFU's Department of Chemistry. And with me as co-host, we have this evening, Cynthia Hansen from our Dean of Science office. Hello, Cynthia. Good evening, Karina. I'm pleased and honored to be a part of this celebration of science and research and to be able to engage with our faculty presenters this evening. It's important that SFU stages this event every year and we have been doing this for over 10 years now. It's a fitting opportunity for the general public to learn more about science research, the Nobel awardees and their impact on our everyday lives. I'm excited to learn more about these contributions. A warm welcome to all those joining us virtually this evening. We have an impressive number of enthusiastic viewers tuning in and we thank you for your interest in this event. To help keep this event interactive and allow you an opportunity to participate, we have a Q&A box on your screen. We encourage you to type in any question or comment about the discussion. In addition, we'll also have time at the end of the presentations to read this out for our faculty. The live transcript feature is also turned on for your convenience if you find this helpful. This event is also being recorded for others to view later and SFU's Faculty of Science will share the material. The organizers will also be sending out an online feedback survey to all those who attended tonight. We appreciate receiving any comments and suggestions you have. Yes, that's true. We'd love to hear from you, your thoughts and ideas. Please send your questions and comments to the Q&A box. We truly appreciate your participation. <clears throat> this evening, especially on such a sunny um, uh, evening. Today, we are happy to have three faculty members from SFU present the 2022 Nobel Prize awardees and their research. We are thrilled to be able to stage this virtual event with them. Yes, that's right. Before we move on and introduce our faculty presenters for this evening, we would like to hear a few words from the Dean of Science at Simon Fraser University, Dr. Angela Brooks Wilson. Unfortunately, Angela cannot join us live tonight, but she has pre recorded some befitting remarks to help us begin our presentations. Let's all hear from Dr. Angela Brooks Wilson, Dean of the Faculty of Science over at SFU. Hello, everyone. The Simon Fraser University Faculty of Science is delighted to present our annual Nobel Lectures. This event spotlights three of the world's most remarkable scientific advances, which are being recognized this year with Nobel Prizes. 
I would like to welcome all of you who are joining us from across Canada and beyond to this special event. Scientific discovery challenges what we think to be true and changes the way we understand the world. This event allows all of us to reflect on and appreciate the work of scientists and to discover how outstanding discoveries propel our collective understanding forward. This year, I'm delighted to tell you that our Canada Research Chair in Quantum Information Science, Dr. Carol Lau, will tell you about the work of three scientists who shared the Nobel Prize in Physics. Their discovery was that quantum uncertainty is a fundamental property of nature rather than a faulty understanding of the subatomic world. Our Canada Research Chair in Chemical Biology, Dr. David Vocadlo, will convey the important work of three other scientists who shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Their discovery was of click chemistry, which makes it possible to snap molecules together and make new materials and drugs. And our Associate Vice President of Research and Professor of Archaeology, Dr. Michael Richards, will tell you about research done by his friend, Svante Pabo. Dr. Pabo was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for studies of ancient DNA, in particular, his team's research into Neanderthal genomes. During this event, these groundbreaking discoveries will be described and interpreted, and in some cases made personal, by these three Simon Fraser University leading researchers. The session will be moderated by Cynthia Hansen, our Manager of Outreach and Engagement, and by nuclear science researcher and professor of chemistry, Dr. Corina Andrew. They will bring to life the discoveries recognized by these most recent Nobel Prizes, highlighting the enduring impact of this science on our global community. I want to thank all of our presenters and moderators personally for taking the time to participate this evening. I also want to thank our Beyond BC community partners, which allow us to connect with those of you who reside outside of BC. And most importantly, thank you to our SFU alumni and donor friends, science students, SFU faculty, and other partners for joining us tonight to hear about these exciting discoveries. Be sure to ask some tough questions during the discussions and make the most of this event. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you very much. This is a great introduction by Dr. Angela Brooks Wilson. And of course, we appreciate the opportunity to talk about this um, interesting research. Now let's move on and introduce our three faculty presenters who are with us this evening. First off is Dr. Kiro Lau from the, our Department of Physics at SFU. You already heard that Dr. Kiro Lau is an assistant professor and tier two Canada research chair in quantum information science at SFU. His research interests include theoretical quantum optics, quantum information theory, the physics of engineered and hybrid quantum systems and continuous variable quantum technology. So we are very happy to have Kiro in our panel tonight. Please, Dr. Lau. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the event. Thanks, Kiro. This evening, our next presenter is Dr. David Vocadlo from the Department of Chemistry at SFU. David is a professor and former Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Chemical Biology in the Departments of Chemistry and Molecular Biology and Biochemistry at SFU. His research interests focus on the uh, chemical biology of carbohydrates, and their roles in human health and disease. David was a former postdoctoral fellow training with one of this year's Nobel laureates. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight, David. Great. Thanks, Cynthia. Of course. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And uh, hello to my fellow presenters, Cynthia, Karina, and uh, indeed all of those who are joining us virtually. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, our last faculty presenter for the evening is Dr. Michael Richards. Mike is an Associate Vice President for Research and a Professor and Canada Research Chair from the Department of Archaeology at Simon Fraser University. His research interests include the evolution of human diets over time, 
especially the diets of the Neanderthals and the, uh, early modern humans and the spread and adoption of agriculture in Euroasia. Current research includes developing new isotope systems for dietary and migration studies, using isotope analysis to explore and catalog the range of na and nature of human dietary adaptions through the Holocene and developing and applying isotope analysis, anal um, analysis in forensics. Good evening, Mike. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction and the invitation to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing from the other speakers as well and uh, hearing any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Again, at this point, we would like to remind all our viewers joining us virtually, we have a Q&A box on your screen. We would love to receive any questions or comments about the discussions. At the end of all three presentations, Karina and myself will have time to read these out for our faculty. So thank you for your participation. Yeah, sounds good, Cynthia. Let's begin with our first presenter, Dr. Carol Lau, to present the Nobel Award for Physics and the outstanding work of scientists who discovered that quantum uncertainty isn't a faulty understanding of a subatomic world, but a fundamental property of nature. The uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics has left many people, including Einstein, when wondered whether our understanding of a subatomic world is faulty. The seminal um, experiments conducted by this Years Nobel Prize uh, laureates showed us that the quantum uncertainty is surprisingly not a result of ignorance, but a, fun a fundamental property of our nature. So colleagues, friends, let's listen to Dr. Kiro Lau to learn more about this. Hello, everyone. So welcome again to the um, Nobel lecture today. So I'm here, so I'm very happy to tell you more about um, this year's Nobel Physics Prize. So this year's prize is awarded to three gentlemen, Alan Aspect, currently at the University of Paris, Clay, and also at Co um, Polytechnic in France. John F. Krauser, currently at J.F. Krauser and Associate in the United States of America and also Anton Seilinger, currently at the University of Vienna in Austria. So this year's Nobel Prize is uh, awarded to them for their experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities, and also pioneering in the quantum information science. So as the description suggests, it is related to quantum. So therefore, to understand what is the merit of the work, we have to first go back 100 years to understand what is a quantum. So in the early 20th century, the physicists at that time believed that they have already found all the physics. So we have the Newtonian mechanics that describe every motion of objects. And also we have the method equations for describing the properties of the electromagnetic field. It seems that everything in our daily life, we know their properties very, very well. The remaining things at that time, the physicists think, is just to get the measurement more and more accurate and to get the laws more and more accurate. And surprisingly, when they keep increasing the accuracy of their measurements, it seems they, they uh, um, find more fundamental particles in our uh, universe that compose of the objects that we see every day, such as the atoms, and then the atoms is composed of nucleus and electrons, and also molecules, and furthermore, some elementary particles. So, so one of the striking effects is that they found that not only there is existing this kind of a fundamental particles, but it turns out the properties of these fundamental particles are very, very different from what we have been seeing every day. So there are many um, striking uh, uh, differences, but I just want to highlight some of these um, that is uh, 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 highlighted in the um, landmark experiment by Stan Gerlach in uh, 1922. So in that experiment, the two gentlemen has made a uh, um, specially shaped uh, magnet, magnet. So in that uh, magnet, the south pole is a little bit stronger than the north pole. So that if we send in something with a magnetic moment, it will experience a force and, uh, and that will push or pull the object towards one of the directions. So what they are doing is they send many atoms through the uh, magnetic field. 
And then so you can imagine the atoms itself has an intrinsic magnetic moment, which we call it as a spin. So if you send an atom that is, the lower pole is pointing upward. So the inhomogeneous magnetic field will actually exert a force and pull the atom going upward. And very similarly, if you send an atom that the spin is going down, the magnetic field will push the atom going downward. So what um, Stan Gellar is doing in their experiment is they randomly, they, they um, send in some atoms as randomly pointing to arbitrary directions. So classically, we would expect that if you send these kind of atoms through the magnetic field, it will have a continuum of outcome. It will distribute um, continuously across the outcome. So depending on how much they tilt upward or downward. But very surprising, this is not they have seen in the experiment. What they are seeing is that um, no matter how they do the experiment, they only see two outcomes, either going up or going down. This has, is sort of very unexpected, and it actually has many interesting implications. First, so one of the main implications is that actually some of the properties of these fundamental particles are actually quantized, or you can uh, imagine it's discreted. It actually gives the name why we tell, call them quantum, it's because the properties is quantized. So in this case, the quantized quantity will be the spin is going to up, or down. So, and there's only two cases, up and down. And furthermore, so the, uh, um, when we prepare an atom, we can actually have strategy to point the atom to arbitrary direction as we want. But no matter how we prepare the experiment, no matter how accurate we make our experimental apparatus is, we always get either the atom going up or going down. This is a bit surprising because classically we think we can point the atom towards arbitrary superposition, uh, sorry, arbitrary uh, direction, but we always get something either going up or going down. So quantum mechanics tell us that this is because if you have an atom that is pointing to other direction, you have to express it or you have to describe that atom as a superposition of up and down with the respective amplitude that uh, uh, um, telling us what would be the probability of getting up or down. And, um, <clears throat> and this is uh, one of the um, strange implications of quantum mechanics that is, it appears that a probability is some fundamental property. And then after the um, uh, uh, measurement, so what Stan Gala is doing is to do an additional round of measurement. So they send in an atom that's pointing to arbitrary action to the magnetic magnets, and then they will get some probability getting up, some probability getting down. But if we are collecting only the atoms that are pointing up and send it to the magnet again, it soon starts, no matter how many rounds we send the subsequent uh, atoms to the magnet, it always gets up. It has a striking uh, uh, implication because originally, the atom is pointing to a particular direction. But after doing the uh, uh, measurements, it's only pointing to us up, but not going down. It seems that now our measurement actually wash out the original information of the atom. And quantum mechanics, we call it the measurement destroy the superposition. This is very different from what we see in our daily life, because in our daily life, we can observe every object as much as possible in whatever way we want without disturbing the system. But quantum mechanics tell us that whenever we have measurement, we have the possibility to destroy a superposition. And more technically, generally, it is impossible to learn different physical properties that are incompatible simultaneously. And in this situation, whether the atom is pointing up or down, or whether the uh, atom having some superposition will be incompatible. So we can either know that it's either going up or down, or it is pointing to us out the direction that possess superposition. This is a very unsettling um, fact. And in fact, one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics as well, one of the best um, physicists uh, in the world at that time, Albert Einstein, he thinks that um, this is not a correct way to describe the nature. In his mind, he believed that if there's a real um, physical theory to describe the reality of the physical quantity, it should be able to predict what happens to that physical quantity with certainty 
without disturbing the property. He thinks that's the way, the reason why quantum mechanics is so absurd is the measurement will change the properties of the um, physical properties. It's just because first quantum mechanics is a bad theory. It is incompletely describing the universe. He substantiates uh, his argument by his very famous paper in 1935, the Einstein, Podolsky, Royce, and Paradox, here known as. So here now, so I um, use the variance that is proposed by David Baum and Harvard in 1957. And in that version, they consider this an entangled state between two spins, two atoms. What we mean by entangled state is a superposition state of multiparticle. And they are able to find an entangled state that the two atoms are always pointing towards opposite direction. So if one atom, for example, the orange one is pointing up, the other is pointing down. And if one atom is pointing left, the other must be right. And then Einstein consider a thought experiment. Suppose we can uh, we make this kind of um, two atom entangled state, and we send the atoms towards opposite direction, possibly very, very far away across the galaxy. So if we measure one of the atoms to be in up, all of a sudden we will know that the other atom must be in down. And similarly, if we measure one of the atoms to be in left, the other atom must be in right. According to Einstein, he thinks that this means that we actually have a strategy to predict the physical property of the other atom without certainty, without disturbing the system. So therefore, Einstein believed that there must be some elements of reality embedded right before we emit the atoms towards the two different direction. This is in stark contrast to what's predicted by the quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics tell us that if the atom is not going to be up and down, it is actually incompatible to the direction up and down. So quantum mechanics tell us that it is not meaningful to tell us whether the atom is up and down simultaneous with whether the atom is pointing left and right. But Einstein think that, no, it is not the case. Actually, we have the strategy to know this physical reality without disturbing the physical system. Then why quantum mechanics will give us so many funny effects, such as the populistic measurement outcome? Actually, the uncertainty of the measurement outcome is not something new. We see that uh, in our daily life as well. So imagine we are throwing a dice. So if we don't know anything and we throw a dice, the outcome is appearing the very random. But in fact, if we know everything about throwing the dice, such as the mass or shape of the dice, the speed and acceleration when we throw it, and also every background uh, uh, properties like the air friction or temperature and so on and so forth, we can actually follow the Newtonian mechanics to calculate what would be the outcome of the dice throwing. So therefore, in classical system, we also see this kind of uncertainty and this certainty, uh, sorry, this kind of uncertainty, and this kind of uncertainty is aroused due to the ignorance of what is happening in the physical system. I should believe that the reason why quantum mechanics can show us so many rigid effects is because um, quantum mechanics is incomplete. Quantum mechanics is being ignorance of an undiscovered theory that will tell us everything. So therefore, in other words, so the random properties of quantum mechanics is nothing, uh, 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 nothing different from throwing dice by ignoring something that we should know, but nowadays we haven't known yet. On the other hand, some there are also other funding feathers of the quantum funding funders of the quantum mechanics, and they have an other opinion. They find that they think that quantum mechanics is actually complete. It is the complete description of how the universe. The reason why we have this kind of um, superposition and also populist measure outcome is just a new way to think about how the universe is working. So the debate goes on for nearly 30 years, but uh, it's mainly philosophical. We cannot solve that so until in 1964, there is a breakthrough by John Bell. John Bell think that, okay, if there is a difference and we are physicists, let's try to come up with an experiment to see who is correct. So I now follow the CHS variant as uh, 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 proposed in 1969, where the first C is the cloud size is also one of the Nobel laureates this year. So in the experiment, they actually use, again, the two atoms of entangled state, as we suggest, and we send the two atoms towards opposite direction to two different uh, uh, um, people, usually called Alex and Bob. 
And for Alex and Bob, each of them can choose two different types of measurement they do. And because of the quantum nature of the uh, uh, particles, for any of the measurement, they will either get plus one or minus one, depending on whether they will go up or go down. And what do they do is that they try to repeat this experiment again and again. And each time they change the measurement setup, they should have the freedom to choose whatever the measurement setup they have. And then they will get either plus one and minus one. And after that, they communicate the result and then multiply the result to get plus one and minus one. And at the end, they try to calculate a factor called S here, but the S is nothing, but the sum over all the correlations or average product of the outcome when they are picking a different measurement setups that they were choosing. But also, it's also what is so funny about this quantity is, it turns out if I turn it correct, there is some undiscovered physical theory that describes the quantum particles. It turns out that that theory will predict that S must be smaller than two, no matter how you set up the, the experiments and how you do that. But on the other hand, for quantum mechanics, we are able to find an exceptional case that this quantity S can be larger than two and as much as two root two. And then the remaining thing is just to do the experiment and see who is correct. And this is the main contribution of the, this year's Nobel laureates. So in the 1972 Clausa experiment, Clausa also envisioned how to do this experiment. So the experiment is very similar to what we suppose, uh, propose, except that they are using photons, which is easier to generate in the entangled state. So that what they do is they first have a calcium atom, and then they try and light to excite the calcium atom. Upon decaying from the excited state to the ground state, the calcium atom will release two photons, and then the photons will always uh, have a opposite polarization. For example, if one atom, sorry, so if one photon is um, polarized in the horizontally. The other photons will be uh, um, polarized uh, vertically, and so and vice versa. But however, we don't know which photon go into the left one or go to the right one to be vertical or horizontal um, polarized. And in general, they are in a two photon entangled state. Krauss has, uh, um, because there is a photon, Krauss can place different uh, uh, um, polarizer to detect what will be the polarization of each of the photons. And from this experiment, by tuning the polarization angle, they're actually going to uh, find out the violation of Bell inequality by six standard deviation, which shows that a strong evidence that quantum mechanics is actually correct, and there's no hidden variable theory. This is a remarkable, except that in that experiment, there's actually a loophole. So although it is unlikely, but it is possible that the nature may try to fix our results. So it is the case here because now the experiment is conducted by the polarizer that is fixed throughout the whole experiment. So that if the nature is trying to be naughty, the nature can uh, uh, um, emit some photons to try to produce a favorable result to break, uh, to, to fix the violation of the Bell inequality. So therefore, this is a loophole. And then to close the loophole, it takes a bunch of more years until Alan Aspect to create a new version of this experiment. The main advantage of this experiment is that they include active switch into the photon. So that when um, the photons emitted, the measurement setting is not set yet. Only after the photons is emitted, the Alex and Bob can freely choose which measurement setup they are using by controlling the active switch. And they close the loophole of that the nature is trying to fix this. So by doing this uh, updated version of the experiment, they can actually find the violation of value quality by five standard deviation. It still show a strong evidence that quantum mechanics is correct and hidden variable theory is wrong. So in the following uh, decades, we start to know more about the quantum nature. And apart from the satisfying our, uh, our curiosity, we start to realize that if we can use the properties of uncertainty and also superposition, we can actually build our technology better. So some of the experiments in includes we can build a computer that is more faster by using quantum and build our communication network that's more secure by using quantum. But in order to use this kind of technology, we need more entanglement and we need to distribute the entanglement to a longer distance. And this is the contribution of Anna Seilinger in the following, de in the following decades to try to push the boundary further. In one of the work that's hired by the Nobel Committee, um, in 
2007, Anders Heidegger is able to extend the tabletop experiment by Klausa and Osberg to a very long range experiment between two islands that is 144 kilometers apart. And then through in this experiment, he successfully found that the Bell's inequality is violated by over 13 standard deviation, still supporting that quantum mechanics is correct and hidden variable um, theory is wrong. And remarkably, for the cloud side experiment, they take uh, 200 hours to finish the experiment. But in Seidinger's experiment, they only take uh, several minutes to complete the experiment with a much higher accuracy. And they don't even stop there. And they try to use the entanglement, uh, entanglement and realize a quantum communication securely that through the entanglement that they can distribute the, through the two, between the two islands that are 144 meters, uh, kilometers uh, apart. So in conclusion, this year's so Nobel Prize allow us to three gentlemen for their um, remarkable experiments with entangled photons, establish the violation of Bell's inequalities, and pioneering the quantum information science. It does not only solve the great mystery of physics that's where does the probability of the quantum mechanics coming from. It shows that quantum mechanics is actually a complete theory, and we don't need no further theory to describe the um, uncertainty that's aroused by the uh, 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 quantum mechanics. And most importantly, we found that quantum mechanics is not an ignorance theory, but we can be able to trust that. And later on, so we found that uh, this kind of properties, we can use that to build a computer that is more efficient and some um, communication a network that is more secure and many, many more technology applications. As a researcher in this area, I'm very excited to see what the quantum technology committee will be achieving in the next decades. So if you have further questions, please read to um, type in your question in the chat and also send me an email afterwards if you want. And thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation, Kiro. Lots of things to, to learn in your presentation. I appreciate your doing this tonight and quite amazing to think of how these new discoveries can actually lead to more solutions. So thank you for that. At this point, let's pause for a few seconds or so, or even just a minute or less than a minute and give our attendees some time to think about questions that they might have for Dr. Lau. So we'll just uh, take a few seconds. All right, I see you folks might be uh, still thinking of your questions as well. Please keep those comments and questions coming into the uh, Q&A box and we'll get to all those um, questions after the third presentation. Over to you, Karina. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. And uh... Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to this fantastic talk. Next, we have Dr. David Volcadlo, who will be discussing the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. The 2022 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to four scientists' revolu revolutionary research into the development of simple new chemistry that are known as uh, click uh, chemistry. Chemical reactions used to make molecules are typically performed by expert uh, chemists in highly controlled conditions, but revolutionary click chemistry now makes it possible to easily snap together two molecules in nearly any type of environment, transforming research into discovery, and especially in the, uh, for new drugs and materials. So, Please, um, uh, let's bring uh, back Dr. David Vocadlo and hear what he has to tell us about the uh, 2022 uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Uh, please, uh, David, take it away. Great, great, thanks. And can everyone see my screen okay? You can just yeah. go into presentation mode. Okay, let's do that down there at the bottom beside the uh, 
zoom in bar. Okay. Is that right? I don't see it. Oh, it's because okay. um is that good? Just if you could do yeah, no, that's perfect. I see it. Okay. Thank you. Great, great, super. Okay. Uh yeah, so so thanks so much. And uh thank you, Karina, for the introduction. It's it's really a treat for me to be able to be here to summarize the science uh behind the 2022 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. I, I really think this Nobel Prize is, is superb choice, um, in large part because this year's this year's uh, laureates have pioneered truly simple chemistry. That's just you know it's incredibly easy to use, and and almost anyone can do this type of chemistry. So this new conceptual new click chemistry allows researchers to stably attach two molecules together, um, snapping them together really like Lego. And um, that's the reason I picked this introductory uh, image here uh, of these Legos, essentially spelling out the word click, because the, at the root of it, the concept is simplicity and the ability to couple things together in a really gratifying, robust, and reliable manner. But you know, before I want to uh, get going, I want to contrast that idea in part um, with what people typically think about chemistry. I mean, what is the discipline of chemistry? Well, fundamentally, um, chemistry is the science that pertains to the creation of new molecules and materials, as well as their characterization. And it, it's, it's all around us. Uh, you know, the Legos on this particular slide are composed of polymers that are generated through chemistry. The liquid crystal display you're probably looking at right now as you listen to me the electronics inside of your computer. I mean, all of these things have been beautifully engineered, but before they end up as consumer products, a tremendous amount of chemistry goes into the science and the development of these fundamental discoveries and technologies, as well as their translation. So, you know, in short, um, chemistry has had a, a revolutionary positive impact uh, for the betterment of society, not just for consumer products, but also for for all of the medications that we take, um, without which you know society would be impoverished. So, you know, clearly those are the positive aspects of chemistry, and people often don't necessarily think of those. Most people typically, when they think about chemistry, they think about complexity and they think about the potential dangers of chemistry. And I, I think that it's it's certainly important to to recognize those things because it's quite right. Actually, most chemistry needs to be done by trained people. So here's a picture of, of a researcher working in a laboratory. And what you can see is that they're wearing gloves, they have a lab coat on, they have safety glasses on, and they're working actually behind a transparent sash because the chemistry that's going on behind, inside the fume hood here, involves hazards, organic solvents that are toxic to breathe in, potentially explosive conditions alternative uh, gases and reagents that are toxic and you don't necessarily want on your skin. So it's absolutely true that, that chemistry um, is hazardous uh, and it doesn't actually you know, get a lot uh, safer when doing it at larger scale as we're gonna see. So there is this complexity that's inherent to a lot of chemistry. And I illustrate this here on this particular slide I don't want you to understand this chemical synthesis, but what this is really showing, I picked this because it's topical. It's an example of a scheme that's used uh, for the chemical synthesis of an antiviral for SARS CoV 2. And here you can see, you know, it starts with this molecule and then using an organic solvent called acetone, which is essentially nail polish remover. So you're, you're doing this reaction, nail polish remover, and then you add sulfuric acid to that. So you know, this is a really caustic um, solution. And then you generate this intermediate, you carry out another reaction, and then you have to purify this molecule. Then you carry out yet more reactions, got to purify this molecule and so forth until you finally get to your drug, molnupiravir, essentially, which is a life-saving uh, medicine for, for people who have been infected by, by COVID. So this multiple steps of, chemical synthesis and purification actually 
you know, only returns back 17% overall yield over six steps. So this is a complicated process indeed. And, and as I said, when you do it at scale, it doesn't get better. Now, this is a picture taken of a pharmaceutical uh, chemical synthesis plant. So, you know, this is all automated now, the chemical synthesis, but you can really clearly see, I hope from this image, how complicated it is. There's all this machinery, the reactors over on the right-hand side, the temperature of these things have to be tightly controlled from very low temperatures to very high temperatures. So there are explosion hazards and, and many, many uh, chemical toxicity hazards. So I think this really sets the framework against which to contrast this year's Nobel Prize. And you know, if we now move to this year's Nobel Prize in 2022, which is shared between three laureates, Morton Meldau from the University of Copenhagen, you know, uh, a very well-known solid phase synthesis who has made a number of uh, seminal contributions in that area for the synthesis of combinatorial chemistry libraries and polymers. Um, and then there's uh, Barry Sharpless, of course, who's extremely well-known, famous chemist. This is now his second Nobel Prize. He won the first Nobel Prize in 2001 for asymmetric catalysis, and he's a in California at the Scripps Research Institute in the, uh, in the United States. And finally, um, there's Carolyn Bertozzi, who uh, you know, is also an, you know, an incredibly famous chemist, um, who is a pioneer in the area of chemical biology and, and glycobiology, um, who you know, uh, is a brilliant scientist and communicator. And I have to say, at this point, she's probably one of the few female Nobel laureates in chemistry and certainly among the very first openly gay Nobel laureates uh, throughout all of, uh, all of the record of Nobel prizes being given out. Uh, finally, she's also my former postdoctoral mentor, uh, a great inspiration. And I have to say just a, a completely fearless scientist. So these three Nobel laureates won the Nobel Prize, not for complex science, as you, you know, I just showed you in these past few slides, but really, as I touched on initially, is for this, this simple chemistry known as click chemistry, um, and also for the idea of bioorthogonal chemistry. So these two uh, concepts, click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry, are really what the Nobel Prize cited uh, and awarded them for the development of click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry. So I'm going to I'm going to start the story of the science behind this Nobel Prize with with some of the early work from Carolyn Bertozzi's group when she was at the University of Cal California uh, at Berkeley. Um, and so Carolyn is really interested in glycans and and glycans are found at the sur surface of all cells. They kind of jut out and they decorate every cell of your body. Um, and they play important roles in development and signaling between cells, allowing the body to cope with infections and signaling other parts of the body when the, the cells are healthy and when they're not healthy. Now, every cell from every organism, right from bacteria to humans, is coated with these carbohydrates. Now, shown here in this picture, this is, you may have seen this back from your, your high school days. This is a, what's known as the the mosaic fluid mosaic model of the of the cellular membrane and what what you have is you have this membrane composed of the phospholipids and those are the blue heads forms this bilayer kind of like a sandwich and in that sandwich are these red proteins these large balls or these spaghetti like serpentine structures and those are also proteins and what you'll notice is also that there are these little yellow dots, one attached to the other. And these are the glycans that Carolyn was interested in. They're coupled one to the other to form these elaborate structures at the cell surface. Now, at the time, there were not a lot of tools to study these carbohydrates. And so the question is, how can one do this? Well, Carolyn realized that you know, the cell is actually incredibly complicated. It's way more complicated than we think. In fact, this is a model of the cell. It's got all these lipids and proteins smashing together and all types of other molecules and functionality. So how can you monitor the glycan selectively? And that was really the trick. So Carolyn thought about this. And one of the things she realized is that there 
are biosynthetic pathways within cells such that you can feed in a sugar and it's taken up by the cell. So here, step one, you feed the sugar in, it's converted within the cell into one of the sugars that ends up being stuck on the outside of the cell, shown here in step three in this golden chains. Now, what you can do, and this was really one of the early steps that Carolyn started doing, was engineering the cell surface by modifying the sugar that was being fed. So instead of just feeding in a regular sugar, she would put on this azide group, which is symbolized by N3, and this would get taken up, and then the azide would stick out here on the surface of the cell. Now, being able to put the azide out there on the surface of the cell is, is useful, but how are you going to detect that? And that was the challenge. You have to detect this unique chemical group known as an azide among this incredible complexity I just showed you over here. All of these functional groups and all of these molecules. How do you do it? Well, to solve that problem, Carolyn and her team turned to some very old chemistry developed by Hermann Staudinger, um, and who also won the Nobel Prize, but for a totally different area, polymer chemistry back in 1956. And so here, um, you know, this classical Staudinger reduction involves the reaction of an azide shown here with this three nitrogens reacting with a phosphine, this phosphorus group. And this, the, the Staudinger reduction just leads to the reduction of this azide to generate what's called an amine. And it doesn't lead to the coupling of these two molecules. But the beautiful thing that Carolyn and Eliana Saxon in her lab realized is that you could actually modify this phosphine with this blue part here to create what's known as an electrophilic trap. So now when you react the azide with the phosphine, it forms an intermediate that partitions and reacts with that electrophilic group to now couple the azide moiety with the phosphine moiety. So you can imagine now the pink circle and the red star can be any two molecules you want. So this work was published. It's a seminal paper published in Science back in 2000. And this is probably the first modern bioorthogonal reaction. And it is a beautiful reaction because what it allows you to do then is to take these cells that now have an azon on the cell surface and couple on a fluorophore so you can now detect where those glycans are on the cell surface and study their dynamics. So that paper and that reaction, you know, uh, is a beautiful and elegant reaction. And in part, that's what stimulated me to go down and work with Karen Bertozzi down at the Calif at University of California at Berkeley was the elegance of that reaction. And I went on to apply that in her lab in a number of ways and have used it since in, in our own chemistry here at Simon Fraser University. So I'm going to move now to the contributions of Barry Sharpless. And and so following that, in 2001, Barry Sharpless coined this concept of click chemistry in this, uh, what is a really an influential review published in, in a preeminent chemistry journal. And I draw your attention to this highlighted text, which I'll just read out. Taking our cue from nature's approach, we address here the development of a set of powerful, higher reliable, and selective reactions for the rapid synthesis of useful new compounds an approach we call click chemistry. Click chemistry is at once defined, enabled, and constrained by a handful of nearly perfect spring-loaded reactions. And this concept of click chemistry really developed from this time going forward and was quite revolutionary in the field of chemistry. The, the Staudinger ligation I just mentioned before would certainly be counted among these types of click chemistries. Now moving on to Morton Meldahl at the University of Copenhagen. This is actually a really uh, a classic story of serendipity. So Morton Meldahl and his uh, student at the time, a PhD candidate, they were trying to carry out this chemical reaction here where they were taking now an acyl chloride and reacting it with an alkyne, this triple bond here shown that I'm pointing out right now, that's known as an alkyne. And we react that with copper you get this copper uh, acetylide, acetylide, and that can actually react with this uh, acyl chloride to give you this particular product, is, which is what they were wanting to get. But it, 
they never did. They got 0% yield of their desired material. So they were scratching their heads about this. It took them a little while to figure it out. But ultimately, what they realized is that, you know, this highly reactive center, that's not where the chemistry is happening. Somehow, this alkyne is reacting instead with the azide to form this triazole in almost 100% yield. This was just unheard of, a quantitative reaction. They did it in all kinds of different conditions, and they used all types of different molecules, and they showed that they always got this triazole with this relative arrangement of the two groups. They published this paper in early 2002, describing this regiospecific copper catalyzed 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition, um, which is why it's known as click chemistry, because it's quite a mouthful otherwise. So this type of reaction stems from some of the earlier contributions by Rolf Huizgen. Um, and in fact, back into 1893, this reaction was first performed um, using an azide and an alkyne. But there, the difference was that there was no copper. This reaction was just heated up to above 100 degrees. And then the reaction would go slowly and give a mixture of these two products, which is really not desirable. So the innovation that Morton Meldahl um, came up with was to add this copper serendipitously. The presence of the copper incredibly facilitates this reaction and gives just one arrangement of these two groups. So you can bring together these two molecules. Now, Barry Sharpless at Scripps in parallel was hunting for these click reactions and came across this totally independently and published it also in 2002, this exact same uh, chemical reaction, copper catalyzed azide alkyne cycloaddition, uh, which became known as the canonical click reaction. So if we think about this reaction, why it's called click is because it's just so simple. This is an image taken from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences showing the azide and the alkyne essentially as the, the buckle and, and the, the other component of the buckle that slots into it and clicks together. And the idea is now that the azide and the alkyne are just these small chemical functionalities. You click them together and it brings these two molecules together. So Carolyn was really intrigued by this because that click chemistry that she had uh, developed with Eliana worked great, but it wasn't adequately fast. And so, you know, there's the Staudinger ligation, you know, that that wasn't fast enough for use within organisms. It's nice to study cells, but organisms, it would be quite difficult uh, to study uh, using the Staudinger ligation. And then the, the copper catalyzed azide alkyne cycloaddition, which is a great reaction. Unfortunately, it needed this copper one that I mentioned before. And this is actually toxic to cells and, and to organisms. So you can't really do this in vivo. And so Carolyn turned to um, thinking about other strategies. And so she was really interested in this idea of let's get rid of the copper. And how can we get than the azide to react with an alkyne without copper. Well, turns out actually that in, uh, in the 1960s, Jörg uh, Wittig, who won the Nobel Prize for something totally different uh, for phosphorus chemistry back in 1979, actually did this type of reaction and reported it where he reacted an azide with an alkyne that was a cyclooctyne. So here, you know, this alkyne, this triple bond, it wants to be straight, but when it's constrained within this ring, it's kind of becomes spring-loaded. You know, you push on it and bang, it'll open up. And, and so if you mix that with an azide, you get this triazole in, in the absence of copper and no heat is required. So this reaction became known as the strain-promoted azide alkyne cycloaddition or SPAC, where you can now couple you know, two different molecules together spontaneously. And I remember the day when Nick Agard, who was a PhD student in Carolyn's lab, who had been tasked with looking for these types of reactions, had found this really encouraging paper by Wittig. And he comes into the lab and he's shaking and he, he looks at me, he says, I, I think I've got it. And uh, I, I found it. And he has this paper from 1961 published by Georg Wittig. 
and, and he, he looks at me and he says, uh, you know, I, I'm not hundred percent sure, but, but the, the pictures look good. And, uh, and, you know, I can't read German, but, but if you look at it, there's this, there's this bit of this text where it says, Fennel Ezide mit cyclooctine explosion sartig, which, you know, basically, I think we interpreted the same way. And, and, and Nick realized that, you know, it meant that if you mix phenyl azide and cyclooctine, they just react like gangbusters. And so that's how this reaction was created. Um, and that has really transformed a lot of chemistry uh, since then. Now with these fast reactions, you can actually do this type of experiment where you label, this is now a living organism. This is the growth of zebrafish. And we're watching now the DNA in blue, the green is the cell membrane, and um, over the red are actually the glycans. And so I'm just going to play this again if I can. Oh, doesn't look like it. In any case, what you can see is that these glycans couple as the cells are dividing, they collect at the middle of this plate. So you're now actually using chemistry within living organisms. So moving on from here, in the, in the years that followed, people have developed all kinds of new click chemistries. And that's just illustrated here. So on this horizontal axis, this is the speed of the chemical reaction. You can see the Staudinger reaction is relatively slow. The SPAC reaction, the strain promoted azide alkyne cycloaddition is faster. And now there are all these new reactions, SPANK and these tetrazine ligations shown over here, um, the Diels Alder cycloadditions, um, which are in, now blazingly fast. And this has really transformed uh, what people are able to do. So, just shown here, this is an illustration of some of the translational efforts that are now being undertaken within uh, industry. So, many companies now are using click chemistry to create new therapeutics, um, probably about a dozen. I'm just showing one example here because this is actually a unique case where they're taking two different components and doing the click chemistry directly within humans. So this company, Shasky here, what they do is they actually inject the tumor with a tumor targeting agent, which has one end of the click reaction. So you can imagine, for example, like the, the cyclooctine being there, just as an example. And then you take the drug and the you infuse the drug into the bloodstream and that would have the azide coupled to this toxic um, anti-cancer drug. The thing is now this anti-cancer drug actually accumulates at the tumor and it clicks together and turns into its active form. So it's not toxic until it clicks, but it only clicks within the tumor. And so it's really effective. This has led to the compound being much more safe and more efficacious. So this therapeutic strategy where you're doing click chemistry in a human is now in phase two trials for solid tumors. Click chemistry, of course, is, you know, transformative for material science because you can create all kinds of topologies. So you can couple polymers together to create all types of different shapes. And this is now being used to create, for example, electrical uh, conducting polymers, like flexible consumer products, and flexible electronics, so among many other uh, materials that are being created uh, using click chemistry. So with that, I, I wanna finish and acknowledge uh, the tremendous achievements of, of this year's uh, 2022 Nobel Prize laureates in chemistry uh, for the development of click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry, which no doubt we will see in the following decades having a transformative uh, beneficial impact on society. And I also want to acknowledge the tremendous mentorship and inspiration that, that I was able to, to gain uh, from working with Carolyn Bertozzi uh, in, in her lab at Berkeley during these early years uh, of this work. With that, uh, thanks very much, and I'd welcome any questions. Thanks so much, David. I can't wait to read the questions coming in. So at this point, I'd like to pause a few seconds to allow our viewers to think through their questions that they might have for David and to type it in the uh, Q&A box. Let's pause for a few seconds for that.
All right, we're now down to the final presentation of the evening to present this year's Medicine and Physiology Award. As this relates to ne Neanderthal DNA, our next presenter is Dr. Michael Richards, Associate Vice President of Research at SFU and also a professor at our archeology span department. Mike will present a discussion of no Nobel Prize winners Vante Pago's contributions to the field of ancient DNA studies, and in particular, his and his team's research into Neanderthal genomes. So let's turn it over now to Dr. Richards. Oh, thanks, Cynthia. Hello, mm -hmm. everybody. Uh, something a little bit different here now. Um, we'll move on to, yes, the, uh, sorry, I'm just getting my things working here, yeah. Um, so this is what I'm gonna talk about today is, is what Svante Pavo's work on ancient DNA and ancient DNA now is quite a large field. Uh, it expands beyond archaeology into, you know, paleoecology and other areas. But he did some of the very first pioneering work and was very focused in his career on specifically Neanderthals and other um, hominin ancestors of ours, particularly this Denisovan I'm going to talk about a little bit as well. So I'm going to talk about sort of just what he, his citation was for, a little bit about what ancient DNA actually is. Uh, then some of the first studies that Svanta did uh, and his team, then Neanderthals and Denisovans, but the most of the work he's done is on mitochondrial DNA, uh, and that's still used and still useful, but then the big change, the big kind of uh, explosion in DNA studies started after uh, next generation sequencing appeared where you could start doing nuclear DNA. So this is from the Nobel Prize, uh, the Nobel uh, Committee website. So uh, Svante is Swedish, uh, and he has been at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. I work there too, that's how I know him, uh, for many years, uh, since 97, I think. And the motivations for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. And for those of us who do archaeology or biomolecular archaeology, this was fantastic, apart from him being an excellent researcher. This kind of work is usually not really recognized by the, the Nobel Prize Committee. It's not. It's not humanities, not social science, but it's not, uh, you know, sort of um, fundamental science in some ways. It, it involves it, but it's it's a little different. So this is how they sum up what he did, the kind of sums of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so in 2010, he sequenced the genome while his team with, with him. This, this includes the nuclear genome. And also the part that I think I'm talking about a little bit more is the Denisovan that he, the Denisovans that he found, uh, that his team found. And uh, yeah, there's the other issue about um, how these hominins relate to us and how we were looking at how they related to us in many different ways, uh, but it didn't really come clear to we could actually look at the DNA itself. So his PhD was 1986 uh, from Uppsala in Sweden, then a postdoc at University of Zurich. And I put this in the postdoc in 1987 to 1990 at UC Berkeley, which actually has come up a lot in the last few talks, Berkeley. Uh, it's with someone named Alan Wilson. And he really was um, in many ways the pioneer of ancient DNA work in his team. And many people who went through his lab went on to do this work, uh, including Svante. And when Svante was there, he moved away from working on more traditional chemistry to working on the genome of extinct mammals, something called molecular evolution. Alan Wilson came up with the idea of a molecular clock. So you can count the changes in genomes and, and determine how far back two species or groups were probably had a common ancestor. Uh, Alan Wilson, unfortunately, passed away at a fairly young age in his 50s. And uh, I think if he hadn't, have, I think many people would say he probably would have actually won the Nobel Prize himself for, for this, for his studies and, and what his, the people he trained went on to do afterwards. But Svante in 1990 was a professor in biology at the University of Munich, but then in uh, 1997, the Max Planck Institute um, asked him to form a new institute that he called evolutionary anthropology that has uh, still going today, Svante is still there, has a number of different departments, but all around this idea of evolutionary anthropology. So there's some linguistics, there's primatology. I was in department of human evolution, which is more archaeology, uh, working there. So it was, it's still a fantastic place to be. So for DNA analysis, I'm sure most of you out there know this probably better than me, but uh, you can use modern DNA of living peoples to look at pop uh, living animals, to look at populations, differences and similarities, the whole population genetics area. But you can also start to look back in time by looking at ancient DNA. So it's very, very degraded usually and present in very small amounts. 
But now uh, there's new ways to, and this is what Swante really pioneered as well, is a lot of methodological ways to uh, and now to sequence mitochondrial and nuclear DNA uh, from the past. So this is the thing that everyone learned, sees in high school. But I just wanted to point this out because the what people worked on in the beginning was using PCR reactions that you needed a lot of DNA to survive. So people focused on the mitochondria because there's a lot more of those in a cell than in the nucleus. And it was just not enough uh, DNA material remaining from the nucleus in the past. So people really tried, but didn't really, what were very successful. So, you know, up until 10 years ago, the majority of this work or more than 10, 15 years was on mitochondrial DNA. And a lot of that still goes on now. We have an excellent ancient DNA lab in archaeology uh, run by uh, Professor uh, Danya Yang, who's looking at uh, mitochondrial DNA of, of lots of different uh, animals and linked to archaeology as well. So there's a really great team at SFU working on this. So just to Give you an idea of how, sort of the contrast of what you can get when you can look at millions of base pairs for nuclear DNA later. But mitochondrial DNA really focused on sort of 15,000 to 17,000 base pairs. And there's 100 to 10,000 copies of this in each cell. That's why it was important for these earlier before the methods changed, because um, you can get enough of it. And what people were interested in is not the coding region, which is pretty similar with all of us, but the non coding region that shouldn't, that can mutate fairly quickly called the hypervariable region that I think probably many of you know, it's just this region up here. I don't know if you can see my, my thing, but it doesn't matter at the top of the control region, the D loop. That's what people have been sequencing for mitochondrial DNA for humans and turns out Neanderthals and Denisovans as well. So Sande's first paper um, was in Nature in 1985. And it's sort of unusual to see now that it's a, you know, a sole authored paper um, on DNA, but now there's um, some of the papers, I mean, I've been involved with them is literally a hundred authors. I think something like that has turned into this massive thing now. Uh, so he was very, very interested in uh, Egyptology. That was sort of his first love before he got into Neanderthals, uh, first love outside of chemistry. So, uh, And so he managed to look and screen um, a, a number of mummies and found that he got one that had DNA. So this was one of the first ever studies that show that you can get DNA from ancient material. Ancient DNA is hugely problematic. You see here, nowadays, I, I'm almost wondering if we don't need to do this anymore, but um, this is how you actually excavate uh, for DNA. So if you're working on a site and you have some skeletal material, then the DNA people pause, they come in fully suited up and take a sample because so little survives, just touching that top of that skull with your finger will add probably a lot more DNA that's surviving there from you. So the modern contamination is a huge problem. And a big methodological change that happened is understanding if you have DNA sequences through time, which ones will degrade and how will they degrade? Is it adenine? Is it, you know, these different ones, how do they go and what are the changes that happen? So you can kind of do uh, experiments to per, like degrade DNA and you see how it changes. So what you do now when you sequence DNA is if you find really intact DNA, you know it's modern contamination. So you're purposely looking for broken and damaged DNA sequences, and you know that's the original. Neanderthals, this is something uh, probably not uh, people in faculty science are not that familiar with, but there are ancestors or cousins. Uh, it's very much debated, uh, endlessly debated, how they relate to us. So they were from 130,000-ish, maybe a bit older, to about 30,000 years ago mostly in Europe, but also in the Near East and Siberia. They're very well rep represented compared to all the earlier hominins. It may be that could be because they're deliberately buried. It could also be that just in more recent times, it's easier to, the, the, they're, st they're still being preserved and enough time the, the remains will decay. Uh, so the Neanderthals are very, very are similar to us in some ways. This is a modern human skeleton on the right and a Neanderthal on the left, and there are many features of the Neanderthals that are quite different. I mean, you can see that this shape of the, the barrel chest, there's features of the skull that are very unique to Neanderthals, including brow ridges sort of on your eyes. Um, but what is interesting is that there are, the features in Neanderthals can be found in almost, uh, can be found in human populations today around the world. So some people, some groups do have some brow ridges, but not in the combination altogether as Neanderthals. So it's been an endless situation of Neanderthals, typical classic Neanderthals like this disappear 30,000 years ago when modern humans from Africa move into Europe. So then we're there, modern humans spread out all over the world. Our DNA between pe people today is so similar, but Neanderthals 
uh, disappear. Were they wiped out by us? Were they, did, was there interbreeding? What happened? Uh, and this is an endless topic. And DNA was probably the most kind of explo the, the newest method to actually be able to address it directly. So this is what I'm just saying. So we evolved maybe 200,000 years ago in Africa, got to Europe about 45,000 years ago. We overlapped for 10,000 years, which is interesting. Uh, but this is a modern human, uh, this is from Oase, that looks very, very different than the Neanderthals that were there. So how do you tell if Neanderthals were replaced by modern, modern How what happened? So was it, you look at the skull shapes and people have, have written endless uh, things about there's people they call transitional. So maybe there's a fossil found that has some Neanderthal and modern human features. So therefore, that's an in, that's a hybrid. That's a child of a Neanderthal mother, perhaps, and a, and a modern human father, the other way around. Um, they try to look at what Neanderthals did and the kind of archaeology they leave behind, and they compare it to modern humans to see if there's were Neanderthals learning from modern humans or the other way around. But DNA is the best. And I put this Owasi up here as an interesting one because one of the key features, if you're looking at any fossil hominids, if you're in museums or you'll see the cast, that we have a chin. There's a little dim, dimple there. That kind of is a, one of the defining few defining things that, of a human. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting to think about that there's a type specimen for many species, but there's no Homo sapiens type specimen. So we don't really have one for that. So this is the kind of groundbreaking paper that Svante did when he got uh, part of probably why he was hired at uh, Max Planck. So that's a femur, that's a leg bone. That's a piece of bone that's being cut out on the top right. And they sequenced, uh, Matthias Krings did this work, uh, uh, that uh, they sequence the mitochondrial DNA. That's the part that's got a lot more DNA than than uh, in the in the nuclear. Or that's what the, where the most of the DNA is. And they found when they look at the differences in that hypervariable region between humans and humans that Neanderthals were very very different. And they separated out. And they concluded that Neanderthals went extinct without contributing modern DNA to mitochondrial DNA to modern humans. So the idea for a long time after this paper came out is that Neanderthals were completely replaced by us. And you have plots like this where you're trying to go, this is up 2001. Uh, so you can look at a common ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans and Neanderthals split up. And these are names of uh, sites where Neanderthals are found versus modern humans and how we really cluster together. All modern humans, very, very different in mitochondrial DNA than Neanderthals. Similar, about uh, they as a site, some really interesting archaeology in Siberia. There was a finger bone found uh, from the site Denise of a cave, and dating uh, to the or dating to about approximately thirty to fifty thousand years ago. And this is I had a contribution to this work, a very small part. Is that that was my work is working on the rate of carbon dating. So this is a finger bone. There's a tiny little finger bone that was found, just a little finger top of it, and they managed to get ancient to get mitochondrial DNA from it, and it was extremely su surprising because it looked different again than modern humans and Neanderthals. So Neanderthals and modern humans differ at about 202 positions in the hypervariable region, but Denisovans from us at about 385. So what is fascinating about this is this is one of the few times, well, certainly for primates, that uh, potentially new species has been identified only on DNA. So that's that was fascinating from this. But again, it's mitochondrial. So you have this same kind of arguments here where they said that's using the molecular clock to predict. So uh, how the Denisovans split off from Neanderthals and modern humans. So then Sanger, then next generation sequences came along, which means you can basically sequence many, basically whatever DNA you find. So you get a lot of contaminant DNA, you get a lot of other, just watching the time, uh, contaminant DNA. You basically, you basically sequence everything you can get out of a bone and you try to focus in on the parts that are the, that are nuclear. So when you can start looking at nuclear DNA, you can get a lot more interesting information because nuclear DNA is, of course, from both parents. Mitochondrial DNA just comes from your mother. Your mitochondrial DNA has this, should have the same sequence as your mother and your grandmother and her mother. Uh, so um, it's faster. You can do this. There are labs all over the world where you basically now can extract the DNA in your lab, send it away, and they'll send you sequences for a few thousand dollars. There's a really, actually, BC Cancer, um, has a really good facilities for this downtown Vancouver, down in Vancouver too. So this then, this paper was quite a revolution. This 2006. So this is when they tried to do one million base pairs of Neanderthal nuclear DNA. So when they started doing this, there's a lot of similarities with modern humans. So is, is there a question, is that contamination? 
but basically starting to see when you look at the nuclear genome that Neanderthals and modern humans are not that different. And there probably is very good evidence for interbreeding with Neanderthals. This is uh, just a, uh, some more information about it. These are the names of Neanderthals, uh, modern humans on the left and, and Neanderthals on the right. So this is how they, one of the ways that you can determine um, the preservation is now using mitochondrial DNA, not necessarily for the sequencing, but as a proxy for, for um, preservation. Uh, and also basically you can, you know, modern humans and Neanderthals very much separate on mitochondrial DNA. So it's a first step. You can use mitochondrial DNA to say, okay, this is definitely a Neanderthal. Let's then spend all this time and effort and fully sequence it. But this is what I was talking about when you get, um, this is from Avindia, the Avindia in Croatia, Neanderthals extract. These are all the things you get when you sequence everything. And so you actually get the primate stuff in there is a very, very small amount. And a lot of that is modern human contamination. So this is not, uh, this is this is an incredibly complex uh, effort that really that Svante's group very much pioneered uh, the methods to do all of this. So then actually the year later, people went through that full sequence and realized there's actually huge problems with it. And they are not, they don't make sense. There's probably lots of modern human contamination. A lot of conclusions were wrong. So that was a big pause and a uh, big surprise. But Svante then, of course, again, with his excellent, him and his excellent team, rethought of it, improved the methods working with the DNA companies that produce these the next generation sequencing, and then produced Three years later, the full um, draft sequence of Neanderthal genome, and this is used today. And it's it's been so today. If you want to go look, I think in GenBank, you want to compare a modern human sequence for some kind of, you know, disease possibilities. You can compare it from us to a to a Neanderthal based on the work that was done here. And you see how the DNA papers now turn into they're not just a sole author anymore. There's a, there's a lot more on them. This also was done with. Um, the, the Denisovan, which I still think is the one of the, it's, I mean, of course, Neanderthals are interesting, but this is just an unknown species we would not have known because there is no, yet there's still no skull of a Denisovan. There's no nothing that would be cl classically how you determine a species or difference. It's still defined by DNA differences. Uh, so it's uh, fascinating. So this is where they got a tooth. This was uh, able to use a tooth for this. And, and then you start to do like the joining trees to see how you compare it to people today. So Denisovans are more, yeah, they're tied more to certain areas of the world uh, than Neanderthals, but it's still very early days for a lot of this work. Uh, and, and China is crucial to understanding this and getting sequences from China as something there. And then this is just kind of, well, I'd say it's fun, but still an incredible feat of research is in 2018, um, they found, and it, again, I think it was from Siberia, I, I can't remember, um, where they argued that the sequence, a nuclear sequence, when you try to do the classic kind of sequence is that you actually, this individual had a Denisovan father and a Neanderthal mother. So this is how you kind of put it all together. It's absolutely fascinating to do that, put that together. But there, you know, Denisovan sequence is based on, on just one, you know, just a few samples. So I've gone through that quite quickly. I think we're, we're uh, well, actually that is 20 minutes. That's good. And uh, just, just, I don't know, just, that's Svante and, and I in uh, China where uh, I think a lot of this crucial work is done. And he had a, a student named Chow, uh, Chow Mei Fu uh, that is, is setting up a DNA lab there. It's linked with the Max Planck and doing some excellent researches there as well. So it's it's now making huge contributions in archeology span and other areas as well. Um, definitely look, they're looking at extinct animals and something that Svante hasn't really done, but his students have, a student, his uh, Johannes Krause is one that is now actually at the Max Planck is looking at, not looking at the Anderson, but looking at modern humans, looking at us, looking at 5,000 year old, 6,000 year old humans in Europe, the spread of agriculture is, are you seeing movements of people uh, or, or just basically trying to, to break to understand a little more and moving almost into historic periods with applying DNA, uh, which is, would never have been possible the whole time I was in the Max Planck, uh, even, you know, it, it, there's just so much modern human contamination, you wouldn't think you'd be able to go get a 3000 year old human modern human bone, and be able to do anything out of it that wouldn't be contaminated by us today, but, but it's, it is possible. So he really took, uh, undertook some of the very first studies, but really the methodological work is essential as well. And what he has done is fundamentally changed, I think, how we understand, uh, uh, human evolution, really, and certainly more recent human evolution. He's got, you know, there's also, I, there's a lot of stuff I left out. There's a 500,000 year old sample from Spain. Uh, there's just so much going on. So it's, uh, he's absolutely, it's fantastic. He won this uh, very, very deserved. So, okay, thanks.
Thank you very much, Mike. That was, was very insightful. Um, um, probably there are many questions from our viewers to learn about these uh, studies about the uh, Neanderthal uh, DNA. Uh, thank you to all our faculty presenters uh, for their uh, insightful presentations. So before we move on to the questions, I'd like to give a few seconds for our viewers to think about their questions for, for Mike and for David and Kiro as well. So please continue to send in those questions in the Q&A box. And as you do that, I know many of you in the audience today are aspiring scientists yourselves, or even students who might be viewing this recording after tonight. SFU's programs inspire students to make real world changes through their work, from doing a co-op work term to partaking in research projects to making a difference in their community. So this is all exciting work. Yes, that's right, uh, Cynthia. Um, we hope that tonight's presentation Presentations inspired our younger audience to become scientists someday. And now it's time to hear some uh, questions from our audience. And we appreciate, uh, we appreciate uh, your participation in this segment. Let's look at some questions and uh, pass them on to our presenters. Um, for example, we have a um, um, uh, question on click chemistry from Sumo. It sounds like click chemistry can make things uh, work better. What about cost implications? I would like to invite all our presenters to turn on their videos. Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question with regards to the cost. Um, I think it really, you know, it depends. I, I think in many cases, you're not going to replace existing processes. But what you can do is you can create new processes to create new materials and new therapeutics and faster ways of getting to those. So I think that's where click chemistry is finding its great place. Essentially, every pharmaceutical company now uses click chemistry in the discovery process of trying to identify therapeutic targets and new therapeutics. Thank you, David. Thank you. There's a question for Kiro. What does this mean regarding Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? It's a good question. So um, a certain, uh, Heisenberg and certain principle tell us that if the two physical properties are incompatible, we cannot learn the answer simultaneously. But when I was learning quantum mechanics, I always wonder, is that just because we don't have make a good device to measure both properties precisely. So if this is true, which means that there will be some hidden variable theory, which is some undiscovered theory we haven't discovered yet. And then some, the, this year's Nobel laureate showed that it's not likely the case. No matter how we make our uh, um, apparatus, no matter how precise is that, no matter what kind of techniques we are using, it's likely that the two incompatible variables, such as position and momentum, are not uh, loanable simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you, Kiro. Thank you. Thank you, Kiro. A question for Mike. How far back in time can we extract ancient DNA? Uh, yeah, thanks. So uh, the most, so far it's been almost 500,000 years, but for, for uh, primates, for us, uh, but there is a, just last year, a uh, really interesting mammoth, woolly mammoth genome of 1 million years old. So that's exciting. And when you're working on those extinct animals, it's a bit easier because the contamination, it's hard to get contamination from a mammoth in your lab, a modern one. Uh, so those are a little easier to, to, to make sure you're looking at the original material. But when you're looking at humans and human ancestors, the chance of being contaminated is, is a lot higher. And that the, you know, the more recent DNA will be better preserved. So um, yeah, so for us, it's, it's very rare, but you know, Neanderthals is probably 100,000 years is probably the most common, but it can go back further depending on the conditions. So. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Mike. Next question is for David. What would it take for the yield of chemical reactions to increase? Um, yeah, so I think one of the one of the great things about click chemistry and one of the defining features is laid out by by 
Barry Sharpless in his review was that click reactions should proceed quantitatively. You just you mix the two together and they react. And so that's why anyone can do it. So many, many biologists, many physicists now use click chemistry in their research um, because the yields are so incredibly high compared to normal chemical processes. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say that the yields of these reactions are really already amazingly good and quantitative. Uh, so I don't think improvements are really needed in terms of the overall yields. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, new question for Mike. Do you think that there might be, uh, uh, there might have been some sort of genetic assimilation in the process of Homo sapiens replacing Neanderthals? Yeah. So if I was, when I was teaching this 10 years ago, there was no, their mitochondrial DNA showed that there is no. But now we have the nuclear genome. Absolutely, there was interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans. And if you do uh, 23andMe in these modern genetic tests, they actually will tell you the percent Neanderthal you have. So I think I'm like 2%. It, it keeps getting changed, but um, you, can, you can see. But it depends kind of where you're from geographically. So this is people more European descent where the Neanderthals were. Uh, so you, you have some uh, Neanderthal DNA. In other parts of the world, you can sort of calculate your Denisovan ancestry how much you have. So there are remnants of Neanderthals absolutely in, in many people's genomes today. So we are linked to them very closely. And is there, is a better, is there a, a higher percentage in certain communities? Uh, maybe the, those that uh, who, who were isolated or? There's been so much since moving around in Europe, uh, but it's definitely more European ancestry has higher amounts of Neanderthals. For sure. Yeah, totally. yeah. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Interesting indeed. Well, we, our next question is from Olivia for Hero. Can quantum states be affected by forces other than magnetism? Thank you. Um, of course. So as I um, mentioned very, uh, um, the very beginning, there are many different types of quantum particles. We have atoms, we have electrons, we have photons. And even the Nobel laureates, they are not using um, magnetic field and electrons, but they are using photons. That they try to interact with the photons, uh, the uh, quantum state of photons by polarizer. So in practice, there are many, many different types of quantum systems and many, many types of quantum systems obey the same physics. So therefore, you will imagine that we, we are trying to use it to build a quantum technology. We can pick a favorable quantum system that we want. And that's what the quantum information community is working right now. And right here in Simon Fraser University, we already have different groups working on different type of quantum systems. For example, trap atoms, trap ions, or electrons trapped in crystal in order to build quantum technology. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions on your end, Karina? I think um, we can... Uh... We can we can address another question for uh, David. What was it like to do research with Professor Bertozzi? Yeah, well, yeah, happy to chat about that. I mean, I think that when I was there, it was in uh, 2002 to 2003, and that was just the time when the copper-free click reactions were getting going. It was a really, you know, a really exciting time. Carolyn was just a force of nature, you know, just a really fearless researcher and everyone in the lab was just incredibly motivated. It was just a very, uh, you know, people worked incredibly hard and stayed right on top of the literature because the field was moving so quickly. So it was, it was a great time and she was very inspirational. Um, in fact, I think that's one of, one of the things I learned from her was to not worry so much about doing new things in research. That's interesting. Thank you very much. I think this was our last question. I would like to thank again our wonderful speakers and Cynthia and Amanda from the IT uh, uh, department for putting together this wonderful event. We are proud to host this every year and to uh, uh, show this amazing research.
And of course, thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us tonight. We appreciate all those who sent in their questions and comments. We hope you can join us in our next discussion. It's actually happening next week also with Dr. Lau. So I hope you can join us then. He'll be talking a bit more about quantum technologies. In the meantime, stay safe, keep healthy, and let's all keep the passion for science and research alive in all of us. Good evening, Karina. Good, good evening to everyone else. And thank you. Have a pleasant rest of your evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great Bye. evening. Bye. Bye.